Welcome to today's webinar, which is called well, What's Lurking in Your Soil? Using Public Databases to Identify DNA Sequences. This is sponsored by GrowNextGen.org and the Ohio Soybean Council in partnership with EducationProjects.org. My name is Jane Hunt. I'm the Director of Education for Education Projects. Today we have with us Tom Fontana, who is the Director of Research and Education at the Ohio Soybean Council. Tom? Thank you, Jane. We're happy that everybody could join the webinar today. On behalf of Ohio's 25,000 soybean farmers and the Soybean Checkoff, the Ohio Soybean Council, we're really happy we could provide this opportunity to you. For over 20 years, the Ohio Soybean Council and Education Projects have worked together to try to make uh, connections to, of science into the classroom, into the science and agriculture into the classroom. So we have uh, an education platform called Grow Next Gen that is there for teachers and students to use to try to make those connections. There's lots of information, e-learning courses, curriculum, career information, industry partnerships, and so on. So uh, we're really happy to have Zach Bateson with us today. Uh, I, Jane, I think you're going to introduce Zach, but thanks for attending, and we hope you enjoy the webinar. Thank you so much, Tom, for being here as well. Um, this is going to be an interactive session. Uh, you'll be using your computer while we're doing the webinar. We're going to lead you through some examples, so just be prepared for that. Um, and also, if you have questions during the presentation, we're going to ask you to type them in the chat box to the panelists and participants both, if you would, so people know what the questions are that are being asked. I'm going to introduce Heather Bryan. Uh, Heather is going to help us co collate all those questions and make sure that they all get answered. So thanks, Heather, for being here. Thanks, Jane. Also, the webinar will be recorded and the link will be posted on Grow Next Gen within the next few days. So with that said, I want to introduce Zach Bateson. Uh, he's going to lead today's webinar. He has been an industry leader with Grow Next Gen since June of 2019. He has trained as a population geneticist. He's used bioinformatics and DNA databases for the last 10 years to search for answers in conservation biology, population genetics, as well as agriculture now. He's currently the lead research scientist at the National Agricultural Genotyping Center and a part-time instructor in biological sciences at North Dakota State University in Fargo, North Dakota. And he's joining us from Fargo today. At the center, Zach and colleagues develop DNA-based tests to rapidly identify pathogens and diseases that threaten crops and livestock around the United States. So today he's gonna to give us a beginner's guide on some of the bioinformatics he uses in his daily work as a research scientist. Thanks so much, Zach. Thanks, Jane. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks, Tom. Uh, and welcome, everyone, to my very first webinar on bioinformatics. I am really excited to be here talking at my computer screen, reaching out to teachers and students that are interested in learning more about DNA analysis. So to start, teachers are very familiar with the content in this image. They could probably teach it in their sleep right, the transfer of biological information. That is how DNA is transcribed to RNA and finally translated into a pearl necklace of amino acids, right, that ultimately, ultimately lead to three-dimensional proteins. These proteins and folds make tissues, tissues, organs, organs, organ systems, to organ systems, to organisms, right? And so to complement lessons on DNA and the central dogma of molecular biology, uh, there are some simple and cheap lab methods to extract DNA from fruits, such as the strawberry shown here, that are packed with large genomes, and so they have a lot of DNA. Something about actually seeing DNA helps us grasp the concepts of molecular biology. Today, though, I want to focus on the next steps. Right, so what happens after DNA extractions? How scientists put the DNA extractions to use? I wanna show you the basic tools that myself and other scientists use to answer important questions in biology. 
through just examining strings of A's, C's, T's, and G's of the DNA sequence. So my work at the National Agricultural Genotyping Center involves soil DNA extractions to search for pathogens that cause disease in food crops, such as soybeans. And unlike these strawberry extractions, soils are more complex and they contain DNA from many types of organisms. Some good, like the nitrifying bacteria that pull nitrogen from the air, bring it back into the soil for plants to use some DNA from bad organisms, like the diseases, like Phytophthora that causes root and stem rot in soybeans. And some DNA from dead things, right? So decaying plant and animal matter also has DNA in it that we can extract from soil. Now, there's several steps between DNA extractions and bioinformatics. And I want to just briefly touch on some of these. And so an, kind of an overview is being shown right here. So we go from a complex soil mixture that we collect a sample from, we extract DNA, we use bioinformatics um, at kind of the end piece here that I'll get to. So I kind of wanted to take all these piece by piece just briefly. So like I said, the first is the soil ex uh, extraction. And so we use at the, the center here, a commercial kit um, to extract DNA from the soil. And when you do this, you get a mixture of DNA, right? You extract DNA from all those organisms that were in that soil, and they show up in this tube here. And so the color, different colored helis seeds that you see here are indicative of, you know, different organisms that you might find. Um, for example, uh, fungi, viruses, bacteria, plant matter, things like that. So from there, then we have to uh, use a biotech called uh, polymerase chain reaction or PCR. I'm sure some of you actually use this uh, in your classrooms or have at least talked about it. And essentially it's a cycling process that artificially makes copies. So it's a molecular Xerox copier for DNA. And so how you use this kind of depends on the question that you have. Our question at the center is to pinpoint specific pathogens in that soil sample. So we use PCR to figure out whether or not that disease or that pathogen that causes that disease is present in the soil sample. Another way you can use PCR is to amplify everything in that DNA extraction, right? So in that terms, you're asking a question, what's the diversity in that soil? What's present in that soil? in general. And so you can use PCR to do that. And essentially what happens is that it's a way to pull very small quantities of DNA out of the soil and that extraction and amplify it to a point where then you can visualize it um, with downstream analyses. And so this figure here is just showing you that theoretically you can go from a single DNA strand and by using PCR you can end up with billions of copies of that particular region that you were looking at. So once you have the PCR product, the next part is to digitize it into a nucleotide sequence. And so to do DNA sequencing, there's actually a completely uh, different chemistry that you use. And I'm not gonna go into it today, but what essentially happens is that you get light signals. So this graphic here is illustrating specific light signals that you get for each of the nucleotides in the DNA sequence that you amplified with PCR. So the A fluoresces as this red color here, G fluoresces as the yellow color, C blue, T green. And so you get the string of the nucleotides that then you can use for bioinformatics. So one of the questions that you might have which is a good question, is what are you going to amplify with PCR? And like I said, you could do it specifically, target a single pathogen and look for it in that extraction, or you can look at the diversity of DNA found in that soil sample. And to look at the diversity, what you use are called barcode markers. So these are regions of DNA that differ between species. And it's very synonymous to the way we use barcodes in everyday life when we go grocery shopping. So noodles, you know, if you're buying pasta, they have a barcode on them that is distinct 
from the tomato sauce that you buy just down the aisle. All right. And so once you go up to the clerk, the clerk uses a piece of equipment to scan that barcode and then the software provides the clerk with what that item is. And that's the same kind of process that's, that we're going to be doing today is we have a database or software that allows us to identify that particular species based off of this unique signature in the barcode region. So how you actually amplify it is um, kind of illustrated here. So if you can take a look at this DNA sequence alignment, what I'm showing you here are three species, species one, species two, and species three. And so their unique DNA sequence is shown horizontally here. So this is species one DNA sequence and then species two DNA sequence. And so they're aligned, meaning that regions that are identical are aligned with one another. And so when we amplify for using the barcode, what we're targeting are universal primers. So these are areas uh, among all the, the species that is identical that you can then amplify all of the DNA that's, or most of that, that DNA that's in uh, that initial extraction. And then during, after DNA sequencing, then you can start looking at the barcode region. So that's indicated here by the different colors. So the colors illustrate where there's differences among the different species. And so you just look vertical, vertically for those. So you see this very first, uh, what we call polymorphism, right? Change in the sequence across the species is this GCT. So they have a different nucleotide at this position in their DNA sequence. Uh, if it's not a coding gene, for example, if it's a non-coding region, you might see gaps. And so if there's a gap in one of the sequences, then there's kind of a dash. You'll see a dash in the alignment. So here, species one and species three has a nucleotide, but in the alignment, the alignment pushes species two and spreads out that sequence. So there's a gap there. So these upstream and downstream portions match up. So that's kind of the DNA sequence alignment, which I'll show you a little bit later in the webinar. All right, so we use bioinformatics once we get these DNA sequences. And so bioinformatics is just the merger of several disciplines, so statistics and mathematics, computer science, and biology. And so there's a lot of different applications for bioinformatics. And I just want to kind of briefly touch on a few of those. One is we use bioinformatics for genome sequencing and downstream analysis, right? So we can sequence a genome of a particular variety of soybean and a different variety of soybean and compare those genomes using bioinformatics. <clears throat> Excuse me. We can also use bioinformatics to look at three-dimensional structure of the proteins, right? So if you look at the DNA sequence and you see a mutation, how does that affect the three-dimensional structure of that protein? Does it make it non-functional? You can get at that with bioinformatics. You can use bioinformatics to discover new traits that are beneficial uh, to uh, disease resistance, beneficial to nutritional quality, beneficial to drought resistance. As we know, uh, with climate change uh, occurring, we need to find these traits uh, in our food crops uh, to help increase yields. My lab, we use bioinformatics for pathogen and disease discovery to help inform farmers of how to control um, for those particular pathogens. And so now that you have a little bit of a background of of how we get from a DNA extraction to a bioinformatics. I'm gonna let Jane set up our case study. Um, before we get to that, do you mind answering a question? Absolutely. Heather? Um, Zach, this is a question from Christine Gertin. Are the only conserved sequences for universal primers? Um, regular primers are not limited to conserved sequences. So she wants to know if she has this correct. She did not know this about the universal primers. Um, I might have to read, read yep, that out. Yeah, let me send it to you right now. Yeah, let me open up the chat quickly here. 
It was actually in the Q&A. No, I just sent it to you. Great, great. Yeah, so everybody can see it. Sure. So, yeah, so when I say universal, um, what I'm, what I'm um, explaining is that it's focusing on a region of the genome that is conserved across species. So universal is just explaining that it would amplify across different species. Um, you can have what you're considering regular primers that um, could sit down in those conserved species too. So it's kind of me just naming it as universal. There's no real difference about universal primer versus a regular primer. The universal primers that I'm explaining are regular primers. There's nothing special about them. It's just that where they sit in the genome is conserved across species. So hopefully that gets at your, your uh, question. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and just read through this farm story fairly quickly, but um, just to remind you, we are going to let you be a bioinformatician today. So um, Shady Brook Farm is having trouble with production of soybeans and has noticed increasing levels of disease despite the use of fungicides. The farm manager elects for a soil test from a laboratory, such as X, to identify potential disease-causing organisms. The laboratory produced a report that contained the top two most common DNA sequences from the soil. Your job as a bioinformatician is to help the farm manager identify the species using the given sequences of DNA through the use of public databases and basic bioinformatic tools. And I'm going to put in here a couple of websites. I'm going to throw it back to Zach. I'm going to, oops, that's not it. <laughs> I want to put in here the, the two websites. You can see them on the uh, screen now, but there are two websites that we're going to ask you to look at and um, use to do this exercise. So I'm stick those in the chat. So if you want to just copy and paste them, it might make it a little easier. So Zach, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Jane. So as Jane said, here are the two websites. And so the first one is the NCBI uh, website. So this is where scientists put DNA sequences or um, protein sequences, amino acid sequences into uh, a database. Uh, NCBI stands for the National Center of Biotechnology uh, Information. And I believe it was established in the late 1980s. And since then, they've been gathering DNA sequences and other types of genetic sequences and putting them into their database. And so this is kind of a national endeavor, but also international endeavor um, by producing this database. And so the actual database is called GenBank, where the sequences are sitting, but the NCBI website is kind of the main page for these. And then the second um, website or the second link shown here are the sequences. So we're giving you some unknown sequences from that soil sample uh, that we want to figure out what they are. So identify what these sequences are. So I'm going to switch over to the website now. All right, so this website is pretty busy. Um, I'm just gonna focus on a little piece of it. I mean, you can click for hours, days uh, on this website and kind of feel it out. Um, but what we're really using is BLAST. And so if you go over right here, hopefully you can see my cursor, is this BLAST symbol right here. And so we'll just click on that. And so what we are entering is the bioinformatic tool of the NCBI website. And BLAST stands for Basic Local Alignment Search Tool. And to not get so technical, what it's doing is it's looking at localized or very specific uh, pieces of the sequence that we'll be submitting and then extending it a, a little bit by little bit until it finds a match in the database. And so this is the bioinformatic tool, the BLAST. So you might hear I'm blasting the sequence. They're using this uh, tool for the DNA sequence analysis. 
Um, but what we want to do is kind of scroll down to this nucleotide blast button. So you just click this right here. And you should see a web page that looks like this. So again, it's kind of a, it's a little bit busy here. There's only a few things that we got to click on though, okay? Um, the first is we're going to input our sequences in this box right here. Before I do that, I'm going to give this a job title. So I'm going to put grow next gen Ohio soybean field. You don't have to do this. Um, it'll just give it kind of an ID number, but you can put in the job title. So the job title is being the job that you're giving this bioinformatics website um, to perform the sequence analysis. So then what you do is you click over to the bioinformatics sequences, and then that's what these look like. So they're on a Google Doc. Um, they're in what we call the fast A format, which is abbreviated for fast all format. And essentially, there's just a little pieces that are associated with the fast A format. The first being that the top uh, piece is going to be the se sequence name. So what you do is the greater than sign or what I call a caret, the caret and then the sequence name. Since these are unknowns, we're just calling this one sequence one. And then following that sequence name, then you get the A, G, C's and T's, the DNA sequence shown here. If you scroll down the document, you'll see sequence two. So the program knows that this sequence one is different than sequence two because of this caret sequence two uh, sample name between those two sequences. And so if you scroll all the way down, you'll see that there are three DNA sequences given here. Those are the three most common that we found in the soil in this case study. And so you can have students or yourself um, just submit one of these sequences to that BLAST tool. But what we're going to do is blast all of them at the same time. So what you want to do is select all. You know, if you're using a uh, PC, it's just control uh, A to select all, and then you can control C. If you're using a PC, it's different for Macs. Uh, but what I want you to do is try to get all these sequences, highlight them all, copy them into this fast, uh, fast A sequence box on the NCBI website. So it should just be a simple cut and paste and you can verify, let me zoom in here for you. Whoa. So you can verify that it, you know, properly copied over to that little box. So again, you're just looking for that carrot, the sequence name, and then the DNA sequence. And then for sequence two, you see a separation the caret, sequence two, name, and then the DNA sequence. Um, and really that's all we need to do on this page. Now there's other search parameters that you can um, do later if you want to play around with it, but really that's all we need to do is get those sequences into that box and then you can scroll all the way down to this blast button. And then from that blast button you just click it and then what you should have is this um, sequence is being submitted. So it's now looking for those sequences that we submitted in the DNA database or that gen bank. And so it kind of depends on how many jobs are in queue for the database. So it might vary, mine just finished, but yours might not have finished yet. And so I'm just gonna give you about a minute, two minutes to kind of catch up. And while we're waiting, I figured it would be an excellent time to practice my dad slash biology jokes. All right, get ready, be excited. The first one, what is a pirate's favorite amino acid? Arginine, yeah? All right, tough crowd, okay. Here's, here's the second one. Uh, what type of DNA do Smurfs have? Blue jeans. Yeah? Okay. Th this is my last one. This is a good follow up. So I told a few DNA jokes for my webinar, but no one laughed. I guess my thymine was off. Yeah? All right. I'll keep my day job. 
Um, if anyone has a question now, would be a good time. Otherwise, I'll continue on. Zach, at this time, there are no additional questions, but you are getting quite a loud laugh in the background with your jokes. Great. It's pretty quiet here in the office, so glad to hear I got at least some groans or laughs. All right, so this is the results page. And so what you'll, there again, it's kind of busy. Um, I just want to point out a few things um, for you on this result page. So I'll zoom out first to kind of give you a feel of it. So there's some things up here on top that I'll talk about. And then down here is, you might see a list. It could be just 20. I think I might be showing 100. But we'll get to what this means here in a little bit. I just want to show you the extent of this, this web page, OK? But if we just kind of now focus in on this first piece here, looks like, unfortunately, my job title didn't take, but that's OK. So what it's showing you here, it's kind of smushing everything together. But um, let me go back up just a little bit, sorry. Everyone. All right, so the, here's the job title. So it says there were five sequences in. Usually if you type in that job title at the beginning, it will share that job title here. But um, what it does is it saves your search also on their server. So you have, I think, a 24 hours to come back to that search if you did a big search. For ours, it's pretty simple. Um, but this is like the ID right here for that search. So you could save this and go back to it in 24 hours, and it'll give you the same data that is being shown here right now. Now, because we submitted five sequences, there this results for is actually a drop-down box. So if you click on it, you'll see all five sequences. And so our sequences that we submitted are called queries, or query sequence one. So that's what this one is right here, query sequence one. So this is showing the results page for sequence one. Now, if I was to click on any one of these others, it would give you the results page for those sequences. So each sequence was blasted individually and has its own result page. We're only gonna focus on this first sequence though. You'll have time to go back and explore the others here in a little bit. So it gives a query ID number. Um, that's just the database uh, labeling it. It knows that it's a DNA sequence just based off of what nucleotides were submitted. It also gives you the query length. So that's the base pairs of that DNA sequence. So if we actually go back to this Dropbox, you'll see that each of these sequences were different sizes of base pairs, so different length DNA sequences. All right, so that was kind of all the information that you really need to know up there. And so really the meat of the analysis is down here. Um, what you'll notice is there's actually four tabs here. We'll take a look at two of them today. Um, this one and the alignments page. But I just wanna kind of focus on this page right here first. Um, the answer to our question, what species was sequence one? is found in this description box. So it's Phytophthora soyae right here. So that's the species name. And so what essentially is happening is that our unknown sequence was searched in the DNA database, this GenBank, and this was the first blast hit that showed up, this Phytophthora soyae. What it also gives you is not only the species name, but it also identifies the gene that was detected. And here is the internal transcribed spacer one region, and then some ribosomal RNA two. One thing that you may or may not know is the ITS region, this internal transcribed spacer one, is actually a barcode region. So it's supporting that we use a barcode to amplify that mixed pool in the DNA extraction, right? And we get this ITS region. So if we kind of look over, um, on the other side of this sequence, you'll see, I'm just gonna zoom in here a little bit. So we're looking at this top description here. There's a couple things I just wanna show you. It's just telling you, it's giving you more information about the analysis. This column right here is saying how much of the query was covered in the bioinformatics uh, analysis. And 100% of that unknown sequence that we 
plugged into this bioinformatics tool was used for the analysis. So 100% of that sequence was used. And in terms of this particular sequence right here that's being described at the top, it has 100% identity with it, meaning that it matches 100%. So it's identical. Our unknown sequence is identical to this sequence that was found in the database. So the question is, what was uh, sequence one? It was Phytophthora soyae, shown here in the description, and it matches 100% with that sequence. Now, like I said, we'll go to the alignments because that's what the bioinformatics tool is doing is it's aligning our unknown sequence with the database sequence. And so if you type, if you just click on this accession number right here, it'll bring you, oh, sorry, that's the wrong thing. I didn't mean to do that yet. Well, we'll talk about this page right now. If you click on the accession number, this is the page for that top hit that we got for DNA sequence one. And so it has the same description here on top. What's nice about this page is that it tells you who submitted it, right? So what research group submitted it, where it was from, um, and then it gives you the sequence down here. And it's just showing every 10 uh, nucleotides, there's a space for easy counting. So this is the actual page in GenBank for that uh, known that was in the database. So I just want to um, step back out of here and click on this. You can either click on the description here or if you go to the alignments tab shown right here. So I'm just so you're following. I'm, at, I'm back at the results page. <clears throat> if you click on this description, it brings you to the alignment. So this is the alignment of our query or sequence one and that first blast hit. And so what's nice about this graphic is that your eyes can quickly scan to look for differences between your sequence and the one in the database. And here it's 100% match, so you're not seeing any differences. You know, these lines in between the nucleotides are showing you how, it, how each of these sequences align with one another. So the query sequence is the one on top, so that, that was ours, our sequence one. And then the subject is that first blast hit. So I just want to, um, before we allow you to kind of explore this a little bit more on your own, I wanted to go back to the descriptions <clears throat> and go down to one that it wasn't a hundred percent alignment. So I got to scroll all the way down to the bottom. This very last one in my blast hit was 99.8 5% similar to our unknown sequence, or the one that we plugged in here. So when I go to this alignment, it brings you to a same similar alignment page that we just looked at. But if you just kind of take a step back and look at the sequence, it's pretty easy to see where that mutation or where that polymorphism is. And so you're just looking for a break in these lines. So line, 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 line. Oh, here's a gap. See that gap? See that space right here? Now in the submitted DNA database sequence, there's an R here. And so R means that there is either, a, there is a G and an A there. And so we use another symbol, which is an R, which means there's a heterozygote um, at this marker, which is pretty typical with DNA sequencing. So, but this R makes it not 100% match. And so you can see that break in the alignment. And so if there's uh, a greater amount of differences, you'll see more breaks in the alignment. So. Um, Zach, we do have a question. Yeah, it's a good time Kale. to ask it. Um, she's asking what percent identity is considered a valid identification? That is a great question. Um, and it kind of really depends on the mutation. I'm going to get a little bit of technical here, but it depends on the mutation rate of the marker you're looking at. So if there's high mutation rate um, within a species, you might see a lot of differences of individuals in the same species. Generally, these ITS regions, these barcode uh, genomic regions, they, 
they allow for, you know, some, some stretch in, it doesn't have to be 100% to be the same species as a perfect example is this one here. So there was a 100% match here because there is a species that instead of having a G here has an A and they're still considering it the same species, Phytophthora. So, you know, I haven't seen really anything with ITS, you know, below 90% gets a little bit questionable, but um, it's really species genus specific. So the short answer is it's, it's complicated. With how we have this set up for teaching, uh, we have it so you find 100% match um, for most of these. But uh, again, you can make your own DNA sequences or find your own DNA sequen sequences and change some of the nu nucleotides so they don't match perfectly with the database. So, I mean, you can go back to this, these sequences and, for example, put a, a G here and then blast it and it'll show up in your blast as a difference. Any other questions? All right, so now I think I'm gonna throw, let me share my screen again. All right, so I think I'm gonna throw it back to Jane um, right here for the exercise. So yeah, now, now it's your turn. Um, go ahead and take a minute or two to look at those other sequences. Um, remember, you can go do that dr through the drop-down menu on the, the box that, ha that has all the sequence numbers um, and see if you can figure out what those other four species are. So we're going to give you a minute or two to do that. I'm going to try and play some music while you're doing that. And I, I see names already showing up in there, but uh, what, it, what is that? the heterotera glycinase, what, what, what is that? So uh, if you find it, that's great, but <laughs> tell, us what you, tell us what it is so people, maybe people will understand. Um, I don't think I can play music while we're doing this because that would mean I'd have to share my screen. Do we need? So is that all right? It, Zach, do you have any more jokes? Oh uh, yeah, yeah, I do actually. You, you liked them so much. Okay. <clears throat> I got two more for you. The first Go one. Go for it. What does Gregor Mendel say when he founded genetics? Whoopee! Oh. The, peas, the pea plants? R -R. Yeah, they're all puns. <laughs> I, I'm only good with puns. All right, last one. Last one I got. Did you hear oxygen went on a date with potassium? It went okay. Oh, very fun. That's a chemistry one, you know, oxygen O, <laughs> potassium K, it went okay. <laughs> very cool. So we have a few answers. We have one for sequence two and one for sequence five. Anybody else looking? Oh, there we go. And just to show everyone too what you're trying to find or what you're looking for is this drop down that Jane talked about right here on the results page, this drop down box. Is there some that you haven't gotten yet? Uh, we're getting there. Still don't see three. I see four and five. Not retire share. Kelly, I'm sorry, Kelly. Hang on just a minute. Reshare the document with the DNA. I can do that. Does anybody have three? Looking for three. Okay, they're getting a ribosomal RNA for three. 
So what do you have? For yep, first that, sh that should be right, but um, the species is what, yep. Should I do the reveal? You may, that's fine, yes. Yep. So you're getting the, the 18S ribosomal, it's glycine max. Which is, we have an answer, ding, 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 Aaron has soybean. Yes. So yeah, if you want to go back to the, the presentation, Okay. And then advance that slide. So just to try and figure out, like, why would, why would we find these things in, these, in this sequence? And remember what we talked about at the very beginning when Zach was mentioning that soil is very complex and it has a lot of different DNA sequences in it. So we picked the five. Uh, the first one was Phytophthora soyae, which is a fungus um, and does cause root rot, right? Um, the, this one we, we've kind of gone back and forth with on how to pronounce. Um, Heterodera glycinase is really soybean cis nematode. Uh, sequence three we got there is the glycine max for soybeans because it was a soybean field uh, and still is a soybean field. Uh, Boss Taurus is domestic cattle. I think we had another uh, uh, suggestion in that one. So that one could be, uh, maybe there's a couple of different uh, things you could mention there, but, and then the last one is the white-tailed deer. I'm not even gonna, I think, uh, I'm not even gonna try that one. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, now the question is, why would we find those things in this soil sample? And, and what might a farmer do about it? And again, I just, just to let people know, this is going to be posted on Grow Next Gen, so it will be a unit that you can use with your students. But this kind of, this last part is kind of the, the question. So we said, we kind of understand why soybeans might be there, right? It's a soybean field, that makes sense. What about cattle? Why would cattle DNA be up in there? We have one answer, anybody else have a thought? Yeah, so if we, if we were looking at how some of the farm management practices that farmers use, oftentimes they spread manure on their field and that manure may come from cattle. It also could be hogs. So there could be other uh, sequences that you may find. And if you wanted to uh, challenge your students, you could come up with different uh, domestic animals that might be, their manure might be spread. So that would be kind of another way to extend this activity. And what about deer? Anybody why deer would be in our sample? Yeah, there's the, uh, somebody has it, Sarah, uh, answered that it's soybeans are uh, really tasty to white-tailed deer. And white-tailed deer like to uh, nibble on not only the beans in the pods, but also the leaves. And so, of course, while they're doing that, oftentimes they leave signs of their, uh, their actual presence. So oftentimes that's found in these soil samples. So the, the key here is that there's lots of different possibilities and there are lots of ways that you could expand it as well uh, to make it more applicable to the area of the country or the area that you're looking at as well. So we wanted to make sure that you had some opportunities to see different possibilities. Um, but the question really is, how do you help this farmer? This farmer has noticed a problem in their production. So uh, thinking about those first two sequences, uh, those are both pathogens that uh, do affect soybean yield. And they, uh, according to the estimates that I looked up, can cause up to a billion dollars worth of damage per year to soybean farmers. So those are things that farmers do not want to find in their field and oftentimes have to have some kind of management uh, decision about how, how do I keep from have, experiencing that kind of loss. So for the most part, uh, for sequence two particularly, uh, it, it is, that is a difficult one. So I mean, cis nematode is a difficult one to uh, control unless you buy a particular um, strain of soybean. So there are breed breeding strains that have resistance to soybean cyst nematode. 
And I believe there are also breeding strains that have Phytophthora resistance, but notice that it's a fungus. Uh, many farmers choose to do a fungicide preventive on their seed so that it protects the seed from being infected by the fungus, at least until germination and hopefully sometime after that. So um, Tom, if you wanna join in there with anything about management, you're welcome to add in if I didn't cover everything. But I think that's that was kind of the key. We uh, you did a great job. Uh, Phytophthora is the number one disease issue uh, in Ohio soybeans and soybean cyst nematode nationally is a huge issue for soybean farmers. So uh, those are two pretty serious things to find in your field. Of course, with soybean cyst nematode, the, uh, the concentration is a big issue uh, to know as well. But knowing that you have them in your field, then you can go the next step and do testing to find out how big of a problem it is. All right. So Zach, what's our next? Is there an additional slide or are we? There we go. Are there questions that anybody has or ideas that you'd like to share? We have a few more minutes if anybody's uh, interested in asking anything else. Yeah, and while we're waiting for questions, I just want to say that, you know, this to me is the first of a few uh, modules for bioinformatics. So we're starting very basic here, you know, getting you to the website, but we, we do plan on having some more uh, intermediate and maybe even advanced bioinformatics um, lessons available. It'll take us a little bit of time to develop those, but we just want to start simple and then we're going to get into the meat and potatoes. Well, and it, it is a, another opportunity to um, work with your computer science folks and talk about that mix, you know, how, how all of these fields are now coming together and using these advanced databases and things uh, like that to help to identify what are some problems and potentially look for solutions. So I think that it's a, a valuable tool for our students to be aware of. Um, if you have questions, you see that there are uh, both emails are there. Uh, we would uh, appreciate you to reach out if you have ideas about how you might extend it as well. We're uh, happy to, to take on all of that too as we try to develop these new uh, pieces. And with that, again, I'd just like to thank everyone for attending this webinar. Um, there will be a link to the webinar posted on Grow Next Gen in the next few days. Um, and please take a minute if you get to go to grownextgen.org to take a minute and check out the other curriculum that we have available. Uh, some of the authors are actually on the call today, so I appreciate your uh, attendance. And then um, we have some virtual resources. I know everybody's looking for those right now. So if there are some other things that you can uh, use, please feel free. And uh, we really do appreciate all the time and uh, that you've spent with us. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much for joining in and asking great questions. Looks like I have one more question here. Um, yeah, can you do that from the Q&A? Yeah, the, the universal primers, uh, do they amplify DNA of all species? And so this, the simple answer is it's uh, yes and no. <laughs> so it depends on what group of organisms that you're talking about. The same barcode regions for bacteria are different for fungi and animals and plants. So typically, if you're interested in bacterial pathogens or bacterial diversity, there's a distinct group of barcode primers or markers to look at that are different for if you're curious about the fungal diversity. And so you use next generation sequencing, if you've heard that before. Um, to to look at that. And we have one person with a raised hand. If you want to unmute yourself, you can ask your question. Amar? Amar? I can unmute you. There's a question from Kelly, too. Yeah, I saw that one. 
Yeah, I'm not um, able to unmute Amar. So if you can unmute yourself, you're welcome to ask a question. I had a quick question. Oh, Are you look, looking you for requests for future webinar topics? I would say yes to that question. Absolutely. Yeah. Definitely open. Yes, for sure. And then there was one up here. Do you have to control for any intracellular enzymes when you're when you lyse the cells since they are diverse cells. So what we use at the laboratory is actually a commercial kit um, that they have a little bit different protocols for what type of organism you're extract, extracting from or the, the type of sample. Um, so you can get variation in the efficiency of the extraction based off of the type of organism, if it's bacteria versus fungus, just because of the different cell structures. But most of the kits correct for that um, in terms of lysing the cells. So like I said, we use commercialized kits, um, which is pretty much a recipe when you're doing the extraction. It's like baking. Yes, um, kits are good. <laughs> Yeah, Rachel is on. Rachel, do you want to talk a little bit about DNA extraction from soil? Oops, wait a minute. Let me allow you. Oh. Hey. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, there you go. Oh. Um, I guess a little bit. Um, I was fortunate enough to meet Zach and we kind of field tested extracting DNA from soil with um, a kit from Kaijin. And I would say for some, it, I don't know how easy it'd be for high schools to order from them. That was kind of a tricky thing to get all the right types of um, materials, but it was a good process for the students to actually see the, the time it takes and understand how long for the extraction piece to even get it to ready to run a PCR. So based on what kind of um, classes you have. So I, for example, I know Erin's on listening. Um, hi Erin. And I know for sure she would probably want to do something and Kelly and Whitney um, as well as Jennifer for those that are there. <laughs> and so um, you have most of the biotech teachers that I know that are on here have the equipment. It's just getting the right primers and, um, and and showing the kids. And most of you have the time, the, the class time, it definitely takes uh, two hours with them. Um, but it was pretty interesting. And then they ran the gel to try to look for a Phytophthora. And lo and behold, we didn't get any positive results, which is science. But also it showed them um, that it may not have been there. Um, in the samples that they have. So it's not a bad thing for that to happen. It was actually a really good thing and, it caught, and they were like, we did all that work. And yeah, and that's how it happens sometimes. <laughs> sometimes it's not there. <laughs> so it created some great discussions. Um, so I, I do, I would love to see, be able to figure out how we can make that happen um, and get that to where more people could do something um, with that piece. Yeah. Yeah, the wet stuff, the wet lab stuff is pretty technical, um, especially with mm -hmm. soil extractions. But that's the nice thing about this bioinformatics is that it's all web-based for the most part. All you need to do is get the DNA sequences and you can you can see that next step, you know, because we're we're really good at extracting, you know, DNA from strawberries and looking at it. And so this provides kind of that extra window into what you know the scientists it, are doing. And Zach, that um, graphic that you had up. Uh, for the, the DNA extraction, um, just for teachers out there, last week, uh, last Saturday, or this past Saturday was DNA day. And what I had them do on Friday for a virtual lesson is I gave them that, my students that slide and they had to go hunt through their kitchen and find something and see if they could extract DNA out of any type of material they may have, fruit or vegetable. Um, and post a picture and give me a reason as to why or why not it didn't work to kind of review that process. 
So was kind of giving them something hands on to do at home as well as reviewing those steps and why they needed um, to use the different extraction pieces. Like what was the purpose of the buffer and what were they really looking at? We do have another question. Um, is there an easy place to find more DNA sequences? Um, so you can, yeah, do I have a couple minutes? I think, yeah. I mean, this could be kind of a, yeah. Um, let me share my, um, okay, let's go back to the, here's a result page. If we go back to that original page, I'm just, I know I'm clicking fast here. Um, oh, not that one. Let's go to the NCBI. There we go, that one. <clears throat> you can actually search for sequences by name. So if there's a species that you're interested in, this is that very first page, you know, here's that blast that we clicked on. If you just go to um, this drop-down box, you, you technically don't even have to do this drop-down box, but if you want to look for nucleotides, you hit nucleotides here, and you can put in, um, generally you want to put in the scientific name. Let me just see if I put in maize, what happens. I put in maize and then ITS, so it's giving the species and the, um, the gene or the barcode marker that we're looking for, and if you just hit search, this is the first time I'm doing it. I'm hoping it, it works, but um, well, you know, you can look for these organisms here as ZMAs. I would have been better if I did that. Let's do the scientific name. Uh, but there's a search tool here. It's looking for nucleotides. And so here is uh, corn, the 18S complete sequence. So, I mean, you can actually pull these sequences right off of the DNA database, put them into a, a document. So here's that, I just clicked on the hit. Here's the FASTA file, or the FASTA file. So when I click this, it's gonna look like that Google doc that we gave you. Mm -hmm. So here's that carrot with the name and then the complete sequence. See, it's kind of messy, it's got ends in it, but I'm sure we could provide an update, you know, sequences, you know, for those that are interested in it. Um, but I mean, so you can actually pull sequences from this DNA database just by using this search function up, up here. You just might have to do a little digging and you know, there's nothing bad with exploring this. You, you can't click too much, you might get lost and then you just start over from square one again, but. Um, well, again, in the interest of everyone's time, I do wanna thank everyone. And um, again, let you know that in the next few days there will be a link to this uh, webinar recording, as well as um, in there will be a, a story that'll go up on the news and events page. And uh, please look at Grow Next Gen for the link to the actual lesson that will include a deck that might be more suited for your students to use or for you to use with your students and then a student page as well. So we really appreciate your time and uh, Zach, so, thank you so much for being here and being willing to share your expertise. As always, it's and jokes. a pleasure. And jokes too, right? And jokes. You can't forget the jokes. No problem. I had a blast. Good. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, uh. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everyone. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again soon. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.